Welcome back, everyone, to Decently Indecent, episode 23. I am Leon Lush. Uh, so pleased to have you here. I want to get into what we're about to talk about today. But before we do that, I just want to celebrate your presence here with me right now um, during this uh, this type of content that is a little slower paced and goes a little bit deeper and less wide, right? This type, this type of content, this podcast, you know, I'm, I'm on episode 23 now. I do some episodes like last week about the Tate brothers that are a little more topical and obviously find a larger audience because of the nature of the topic and the way the internet works with clicks, et cetera. <clears throat> and then there's times where I do episodes from like a couple weeks ago where I talked about purpose or uh, the episode where I talked about apathy and self-sabotage and things like that. Just episodes that are less about what's going on in the world and more about uh, values, personal character, things that I think are important in, in one's life. So today, as I pour out of this globe decanter, a little, a couple fingers of Jameson whiskey, um, as always, I like to enjoy a few fingers while we, we chat about, about life together. I wanted to talk very bluntly about some of the tenants that I think make a high value individual, high value man. Specifically, I would say this is more specifically talking to men today. I'm certainly there could be something that 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 women could 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 glean and find valuable in this too, but I mean, I'm speaking to my own lived experience. And when I say the words high value man, I know that's been conflated by people like the Tate brothers who we talked about last week where it has to mean money or success, and that's not really what I'm speaking to here. This is more about high value in the sense that you are a person that is, you know, you are the type of individual that's living a life that you can be proud of, I think. And obviously money and success can come from that. I often find that people that are successful and the type of person that people look up to and admire and people revere are the type of people that are high value men without money and that money and success follows them because of how they carry themselves and how they behave and how they live their life. I truly I think that's a very important delineation. I think there's a lot of rich men that are very low value losers because of the way the world works. That just happens sometimes. So going into this video, I didn't, I wasn't like looking on Google for like different lists and stuff. I just opened up a notepad and I wrote down a few things that to me in my life and my lived experience over the last almost 40 years, um, things that I think are important as a man trying to make his way uh, in this difficult world society, wherever you, wherever you live, wherever you're from. Um, and also things that have served me well. And I, I'm sure a lot of these probably are not surprises, but I just wanted to speak about it uh, very directly for those of you, you know, I, this kind of, this came from last week when I was talking about the Tate brothers and how they got raided and arrested again. And then, spoke briefly about how they've become, you know, over the last four or five years, these de facto manosphere role models for a lot of young men that are essentially lost and looking for direction and purpose on the internet, because that's where most people spend all of their time. You know, there's, there's a, a real vacuum of role models. I think that may be due to the fact that people aren't looking as hard in real life anymore. I think there's plenty of, 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 of valuable role models in real life, but people are just not searching them out because we're, we're complacent and happy to just spend all our time scrolling on our phones and on our computers and playing video games, et cetera. Right. So, so this is where that comes from because I spoke about them and how I was saddened, you know, ultimately I'm saddened just to see how they've become this poster child for male, uh, you know, kind of like conservative right-wing role model. I say that in a way that's not meant to be political, but just in a, in a way that's, you know, that's meant to to say that the Tate brothers, you know, they have some values that make sense and that I agree with, but at their core, I, I truthfully just, I think they're just kind of shitbags. That notwithstanding, putting them behind us, that made me just think about like, hey, Leon, like what do you, if you're going to talk about the Tate brothers and how you think they're, you know, you, they're shitty, like let me just write up, up a couple of things. And so I came up with a, a little bit of a list and a few things I want to go through that I think if you're somebody who's, maybe you're a younger dude who, uh, watches my content and you've seen me develop over the years and I've been valuable to you in some way, whether through entertainment or whether it's through this podcast or I've made you laugh or whether you like watching my wife and I together and value the the relationship that we have, whatever it might be. 
I'm just offering this up as, as a little insight into how my mind works. And this is not an exhaustive, an exhaustive list by any means. This is more of an off the cuff, a couple of things that I, I really value. And there's a lot more to this. I could go on for hours, but I'm going to try to make this brief just as a, a little bit of a, a direct tidbit of wisdom. So as a man in our society, there is a lot of different paths you can take. There really isn't a lot of concrete instruction and direction on what to do. It's very, you know, I think it's an, I think you get to a point in your life as a dude where you kind of, you go through the system, whether that's school, whether or not you go to college, maybe you skip college and start to work or you go to trades or whatever it is, but you you reach this point in your life where the, the adolescence wears off and you are now an adult man and you realize that you're kind of carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. In a sense, you have responsibilities. Nobody is there to hold your hand or to look out for you. Um, and there's going to be a lot of trial and error and there's going to be a lot of pain, a lot of hardship, but you are ultimately responsible for creating your story, creating your life. And there's a lot of different people that can come and go from that. There's relationships with friends and family. There's relationships with future partners and wives and whatever, whatever else it may be. And there's obviously a lot of dynamics at play, depending on where you're from and what societies you live in. I'm speaking strictly from an American perspective because that's what I've grown and lived. And I think a few of the things that have served me well and that I've, I look back on and be like, hey, these are things that maybe I, I really gave more consideration when I was younger in my 20s. I, do, I think everyone has a different timeline for when they really start to look inward and do some introspection and start taking inventory of the things that matter to them and then start acting accordingly. Um, I was maybe a little late bloomer in that sense, man. I spent a lot of my twenties kind of like fucking around and I was, you know, I was pursuing some dreams and goals, but I wasn't, I just was a typical dude. I went through college, did the college thing. I'm pretty good at school stuff. So I was able to get through college and have pretty good grades without really busting my ass too hard. I was very social. I'm good with people. So the relationship piece was great. I had a great experience, did some good grades, but I was never like on a path to like be this thing and do really good at that. I was just like doing it because it was what I was supposed to do. And then I graduated college and realized that I didn't want to use my degree and I got a sales job, realized I didn't want to do that. It was like, so I was, my twenties my were a huge decade of learning for me. And I think one of the, I think one of the hard parts with being a young man is even more so today, it feels like the responsibility of having to be this wonderful, successful alpha male has skewed younger and younger. So like kids that are in their teens, they get to 20 or 21 and they feel like they should have it figured out and that they should already be successful and written, like know what they want to do. And I just don't think that's the reality. I think it's easy to, 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 to build this illusion because we're constantly consuming and watching things on our phone where it's like the highlight reels of everybody's life. And it gives us a very skewed perspective of what that reality actually is for each individual. But I think most of life is a, is a bit of trial and error. And then just slowly whittling away once you make all those errors and being like, these aren't working, let me try something else. And let me, let me try to spend some time sharpening the iron of my character, because I think that would benefit me in my future, whether that's financially or in my relationships. And I think it really skews heavily for young people, especially. I know there's there's definitely, I think because of social media and all this stuff, there's definitely an obsession with financial success specifically. And I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be financially successful. But like I said at the beginning of this podcast, I think that a lot of people put too much value on that and that alone. And it's possible to be financially successful in a shit bag that lives a terrible fucking shitty life and then spirals out of control and goes off the deep end. I mean, we see this all the fucking time with Hollywood and people that come into riches that don't have a moral foundation and a character to stand on. But if you work on these particular characteristic traits and these tenets of what it means to be a high value man, the financial success typically eventually comes because for whatever reason, money tends to follow people that are constantly growing and concerned with trying to better themselves in their situation. So the first thing I want to talk about is personal accountability. I think this is the end all and be all number one character trait of a high value individual, which basically means no matter what, you know, no matter what happens to you, whether you're slighted by somebody or you get cheated out of money or someone steals from you, like 
whatever it might be. You don't waste a second pointing fingers in placing blame. You take responsibility. This happened to me. It might not be your fault. It might be. It doesn't even really matter because the only thing that matters and the only thing you care about is not the fact that it happened, but about what you're going to do about it, right? And what you're going to do now about it. And that can come in a lot of forms. That can be people with health conditions. That can be people that have gone through traumatic life experiences that have changed the course of their life. This is people that are in financial distress, uh, people that are in the uh, uh, going through a divorce. Whatever circumstances life might throw at you, there are two types of people. There are people that will constantly deflect and point and blame and never just be like, okay, you know what? This is my life. I'm in this situation. It doesn't matter how I got here. Now I have to take responsibility for it and figure out what the next move is to make it better. There are so many people that waste months and years of their life bitter and angry and just so mad at what happened to them. And it's something that there's, there's nothing you can do about it. Like that, that happened. Doesn't matter. Put yourself in a situation where it doesn't happen again and move the fuck on with it. There is nothing else to do. Every moment you waste stewing and lamenting and in, in holding this kind of like vitriol inside of you over your circumstance or you're so mad because this person had it so easy and I was, you know, I got cheated. I was unlucky, whatever the fuck. None of that fucking matters. Nobody cares. The only thing that matters is that you're able to completely detach yourself from that and immediately focus on what you can control in the here and now and how to move forward so you're not in that circumstance again in the future. This also means knowing when you fuck up, right? You know, there are times, like I said, when things happen that aren't your fault and someone that's personally accountable will say, man, that sucks. On to the next, we're figuring this out. As opposed to sitting around and wallowing, being like, I can't believe this happened to me. Oh God, my love. Oh my God. It's, everything's so hard. I'm just so unlucky. Like when it rains, it pours, you know, like <laughs> old bull. Cool, man. That's fine. Those things happen. Move on. But then the other side of it is like, yeah, if you fuck up and you do something to hurt someone or you do something that you know is is not right, you know deep down in your soul that what you did was fucked up, personal accountability is taking ownership of that. It's knowing when to apologize. It's knowing when to say, hey, this one's on me. It's my bad. Here's what I'm going to do to make it right. Here's what we're going to do moving forward. Personal, personal accountability is the number one trait of a leader, right? And I, any anything I'm talking about today too, I'm talking just through my own lived experience. And I'm not somebody who is a born leader. I'm not someone who's necessarily uh, uh, this kid who was born with this overwhelming confidence and drive to be successful. I would say on the contrary, it's quite the opposite. I grew up very insecure. I was a heavier child. I've talked about this a lot, so I won't go into it too much, but I was fortunate to have some really good role models in my life and some people that were able to lead by example and instill some character traits in me that made me resilient and always wanting and always hungry for growth and improvement. Uh, and that's allowed me to be able to grow into an adult now that stands here as somebody who's you know pretty proud of who I've become. Not without my faults though. You know, I still have my demons. I talk about this all the time. I have these things, even on this list, these things that I value greatly that I struggle with a lot. But personal accountability is one of those things that is just bare minimum of being a, 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 a man that somebody can respect is you just have to be able to take the shit. You have to be able to eat the shit, figure it out and move the fuck on because every second you waste wallowing and pointing fingers is just some real pleb shit, some real wasted pussy ass shit. That's, that's kind of, that, that's really it. You could go for hours on personal accountability and how important it is, but um, there's nothing worse than somebody that doesn't know how to, doesn't know how to eat crow, take the blame when it's due or just move on when it's time. Another thing that's really served me well in my life. I think we're in an, inter an interesting age where this particular trait is been conflated with selfishness. And what I'm talking about is generosity and selflessness. I've never once in my life felt regret after doing something generous for somebody. I know that sounds super simple, 
because it kind of is. I think the, the lens that these things are viewed through has shifted so drastically over the past few decades because, again, of social media and our access to media. When you think of generosity and selflessness now, like you ask any teenager, young kid, like, oh, what, what does generosity mean to you? And it's like, oh, Mr. Beast gives people $500,000 in all of his videos. And it's like, well, Mr. Beast gave $10,000 to a homeless man or like, oh, my favorite YouTuber like bought 300 cheeseburgers and handed them out to homeless people on the side of the street. That's why I think we've really conflated generosity and selflessness because true selflessness comes from a place where there is no ulterior motives attached. And I think that social media has turned performative generosity into a form of content. Right. And I think performative generosity comes from a place of selfishness because it's how can I, how can I do this nice thing for you and look good for doing it? But the underlying motive is selfishness because of what I'm going to get in return for it. And it's tough because, you know, this is something I've wrestled with for years over like the Mr. Beast model. And because you're, all of these good things you're doing beget the content that you are making, right? Your own, the reason you're doing it is because it makes viral content. And I've always thought, well, the net, the net net is someone's having something good done for them. So even if you do have ulterior motives that are selfish, I still think it's a net positive because at least you're doing it. And I still, I still genuinely believe that. But what I'm speaking about, when I talk about generosity and selflessness, I mean, just in your everyday interactions with people. And this doesn't mean just financially, right? This means this can be with time. You can be generous with your time to someone who really needs it, to someone who needs an ear. It can be difficult too, because there are people that will take advantage of people that are too generous and selfless with their time. So you have to be self-aware enough to draw boundaries when it's necessary. But whether it's with money or time or your hands helping someone move. Like I've just, I just don't ever remember a time in my life where I've regretted doing something nice for someone that I care about, or more importantly, being generous and selfless for, with somebody that you don't know. I just can't stress that enough. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's this idea, just the, the simple idea of doing something good for someone else with zero expectations of a return on that investment of time or money. And that's where social media has fucked that all up because it feels like everything we see online, everything nice and everything generous and selfless people are doing for other people, it's, it now always has to be recorded because you want the return of attention. You want the return of virality, which can turn into money because attention is money. And that conflation, I think, has really fucked it up. Being generous and selfless with your time can't recommend it enough. And again, that's not, that's not, I, this is again, something I don't do enough. I really believe. I think that I'm, I think that, I think that I'm generally probably a selfish person, but as I've aged, I've, I've had to, you know, look at myself and take inventory of things that matter to me. And that is one of the things I try and work on. And I'm, and I fall short quite often, but at the very least I can, I can smile at people. I can behave in a way that is, makes people feel better, makes people feel good. I think that's one of the ways I've been able to do that. And then obviously there's other things I, I do in my personal life that I don't need to talk about, but I think that's important. Another thing I think is very important, perseverance, pretty straightforward. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. See things through, stick through it. Even if it feels shitty, even if you're stuck in the mud and it sucks, see it through because you committed to doing it. Now there's obvious outlier cases where you have an idea when you try something and this obviously comes up a lot in business and maybe the business isn't a success. There is an element of needing to know when to cut your losses, but I think it boils down to the idea of delayed gratification. Social media has really trained our brains to expect immediate gratification and results from everything we do. And this is a horrible illusion because almost everything good in your life will come from a persistent effort over time that feels almost wasted at the time. You feel, oh, well, I just keep spinning the wheels and I'm putting the time in and I, I'm not getting the return that I thought I would. But in business and in relationships and life and in financials, there's this kind of exponential graph, right? Where you see this, if you look at the graph of several years where this thing is just trending almost horizontal, maybe up a little bit and you hit this inflection point and then boom, goes vertical for a time. And that that is the nature of delayed gratification. 
It is momentum. It is doing things. It is eating shit for weeks, months, and years because you know that there could be a payout in having the perseverance and the grit and the tenacity to stick with that during the shit eating phase and hoping that eventually you can you can have that payout, that that S curve and hit that inflection point. Now, life is unfortunately a cruel mistress and at times some things won't work, right? There's certainly a little bit of luck that's sprinkled into this type of thing. But I think if you don't at least have a base level of perseverance, it's gonna be very difficult to do great things. And you, and I, when I say great things, it's very general, but it's going to be very difficult to do or create a life that is a little bit abnormal in a good way. Being a man of your word next on my list, similar to the perseverance in the sense that if you say you're going to do something, do it, especially if you tell people there's, you know, there's really, I can't think of anything that's more annoying than the guy who just says I'll talk and no follow through. And, you know, this can be as simple as someone like, you know, the guy that like anytime that the boys are making plans and everyone's, oh yeah, this is awesome. Let's do it. And like, you're all into it. You make the plans and the guy always backs out. Like he's all about it. And then there's all, something always comes up. Oh, this, I have the excuse or oh, this, cause sorry, oh, it came up. There's legitimate excuses, and then there's just people that are all talk because their word means nothing. And that's embarrassing, honestly. When you say things and you don't follow through on them and you do it for an extended period of time, the people around you are conditioned to believe that your word basically means nothing. And I can't think of anything more embarrassing than being a man whose words are completely powerless. You know what I mean? Like, and that, that just comes from repetitions of not following through on what you say. So when you commit to something, when you say something, follow through on that thing. Obviously, there's times you're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to fail, whatever it is. But specifically, if you're committing to something to do someone for someone, don't be the person that just, you say something and, and, the, and the person on the other end in their head, they're like, yeah, okay, sure, buddy. I bet. Appreciate the, appreciate the candor, but I know you're, I know you're full of shit. That sucks. That's the worst. Don't be that guy. I would also say too, like when it comes to being a man of your word, you know, don't beat around the bush, have difficult conversations. These are very difficult things, especially this day and age, I think uh, for younger, uh, younger teens growing up and into men, because we've, we've become so conditioned to handle everything digitally. The idea of con confrontation and having difficult conversations in person and really attacking the obvious elephant in the room with family, with friends, these things, these things that are, are so easy to avoid. And this is something that I've really had to work on in my life because I am not a confrontation guy. Some people are good at it. Some people love it. Some people love the drama. I am a people pleaser. I just want people to be happy. But there is nothing worse than just letting something eat at you because you're just you know what needs to be addressed and you're too fucking pussy to address it. It's the worst. It's such a waste of time and energy and emotional emotional strength. Like you just gotta, you just gotta address it. The second you know something to be true in your soul, your gut, you let that be your compass and you don't waver because you're scared of how people might think of you or what someone might say. You know, this, and this is difficult, like I said, because a lot of us are people pleasers, you know, but Truly, there's nothing, you know, more masculating than just constantly changing who you are based simply around, you know, based simply on who you're around. Be consistent. You need to be yourself. You need to practice being yourself so you get comfortable at it. And people will either love you or they will hate you for it. And that's fine. But the, you know, but most people will at least respect you. But the guy who's a chameleon that's constantly trying to fit in and do these things, nobody respects that guy. Because eventually you get found out. You know, you're cool for a while because everyone likes you, but eventually people start to realize, oh, you're just, you only, you're only always acting this way because you want to come across a certain way, depending on who you're around. That, that's tough. Again, I'm speaking about this from my own personal experience. This is one of my weaknesses. I've most of my life tried to be the chameleon and I still struggle with this. And as I've gotten older, I've slowly gotten a little bit better at staying true to myself and my values and my beliefs and just not trying to transform how I behave and what I'm talking about, what I say based on what I think the people around me are going to. That's been one of the the, the, the areas of my life I've had to work on the most because I'm such a, I'm such, I have such a personality that really doesn't like confrontation that would, someone could say something that I totally disagree with. And my first instinct is to totally agree with them because I want them to feel good and I just don't want there to be an issue. But I think that's so spineless and there's nothing more emasculating than just being 
too scared to be yourself because you're afraid someone's going to not like you or, you know, not like something you have to say. That's one of the ones I've been focusing on the last several years of my life that I've gotten a little better, but I think it's going to be, you know, that'll be something that I have to work on forever just because it's part of my personality, but I think it's important to stay aware of it because there's nothing more freeing than truly being comfortable in your own skin. And that kind of leads to the next one, which is confidence. I mean, and confidence is a, a big umbrella. Let's be honest. There's a, a lot of different areas and a lot of different ways that people can build confidence. And it comes, you know, people, I think as individuals, we pull confidence, confidence from so many different places in our life. And that comes from a few things we've already spoken about comes from, you know, being a man of your word, you know, perseverance. When you say you're going to do something, do it. Confidence comes from trusting yourself, which comes from following through on things you tell yourself you're going to do. If you're the guy who says, oh, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to try this, I'm going to get to this goal, and you're just constantly letting yourself down, it's hard to be confident. If you can't even be confident in yourself, that you're going to follow through on anything you say. It also comes down to the effort given to taking care of oneself. And that can be physically, mentally, emotionally. I think that challenging yourself physically is the bedrock of where confidence is built. You know, I just think any, anyone that, that, that takes themselves to task, doing hard physical shit, challenging their body, growing physically, whatever that looks like, could be endurance training. It could be sprinting. It could be sports. It could be pickleball, whatever the fuck it is. If you are letting your body decay and waste away doing nothing, how can you possibly be confident? And yourself, I don't know. That's just my personal opinion. And there's so many different ways to challenge yourself. Obviously, we all have our own. I've talked at length about my life and how important a role lifting and fitness and those things play in my life as kind of the the blanket of confidence that I build all the other areas of my life on. And the other piece of that is challenging yourself mentally and emotionally. And that can come from a lot of different places too. Reading, being intentional with your relationships being judicious and intentional with what you consume. I think this is a big one that isn't talked about enough. And, it, you know, it's kind of built on the back of reading. Like, I feel like so many of us feel like we're always reading. It's like, yeah, we're, we're always like scrolling, clicking headlines, reading articles. We're getting little tidbits, little bylines here and there. But what is that really, if you're not being intentional with what you're reading, like, hey, here's this, here's, you know, it's, I think it's very easy to just be constantly led all day long with like headlines and we're constantly chasing the next dopamine hit that it feels like we're consuming information and getting smarter, but really it's just kind of like partitioning our brain to not real. it's, it's just tearing it in 50 different directions. So it's taking time, 30 minutes before you go to sleep, pick a good book that you know is going to be beneficial to you. That has a lot of reviews and a lot of people have said have been valuable to them. You sit down undistracted. You read through that 30 minutes a night, you get through that book. I know this sounds crazy. Some people are very good at this. This is something I work out a lot because I am a victim of being fragmented and having my attention be pulled all over the place that it's difficult for me to sit down and do something uninterrupted for an hour. So I have to be honest with myself about that, right? I look in the mirror, I'm like, hey, I know this is going to be valuable to me. So I have to intentionally turn the phone off, leave it in the other room, sit down, consume this content, read this, whatever it might be. It could be content. It could be video. It could be video instruction, something, but something that isn't just being pushed into your life based on an algorithm, something that you're intentionally seeking and consuming on purpose to train or sharpen or enhance your skill set in some way. I think that's very important. And some people are better at this than others, but I think there is a disproportionate amount of people that are literally just being led Every single day they wake up and there's a fish hook in their cheek and they're just being fucking reeled along by fucking Silicon Valley, just being reeled in all day long. Everything they consume is just literally popping from one thing to the next. It's a TikTok reel. It's a feed. It's a fucking, you, you, you pop, you open the Google app to search something and there's a Google headline. All of these things that are being curated to get your attention, weeks and months go by and your brain is just a puddle of shit because you're spending no time actually focusing on a specific thing that you're growing in. I think that that's obviously a little bit of a harsh reality 
I think it exists. I think there's pockets of time where even amidst that we can, all of a sudden we find something we're very interested in and we've spent like an hour or two hours learning and reading about it and it's great and that's cool. But I think it really just comes down to intention and, and, you know, the analogy of the, you know, the mind and the body, like challenging yourself physically, lifting weights, exercising, hiking, running, sprinting, whatever that is, those are intentional acts of doing something that takes focus and determination in something that is not necessarily fun to do, but you know that the outcome and the results from doing that thing consistently will be good for you physically and mentally and emotionally, it's no different, right? You have to intentionally take the time to challenge yourself, do things that are hard, that take focus that you wouldn't do without intention and the payoff can be huge. And I think, you know, I've, I've gotten good at the physical piece of that making, being consistent with that. I am still struggling with making sure I'm being intentional with what I consume because I consider just like Instagram, all the kind of like the, the algorithmic feeds, I consider that sort of content kind of like just the, the sugar, the sugar of the diet. It's like, you know, you just constantly, you're drinking soda, you drink, you're crushing 20 ounces of apple juice, you're eating candy, you're eating apple pie. And you just, your brain just gets diabetes, bro. Like it just fucking crushes you because you're just constantly getting these little hits. It's not really doing anything beneficial for you, but you need some fucking protein. You need some lean ass beef in your, in your mental life and your month in your mental and emotional health. And that comes from longer dedicated, intentional sessions of consuming things that are maybe more difficult to consume. Delayed gratification always comes back to that. Emotional intelligence. You know, and here's, this is a big one, emotional availability, or I would say like being emotionally available and in control. And that's kind of incongruence with emotional intelligence. I think this is a big one for men, young men, adults, anyone in my line of content. It takes it, two seconds. You go online and it's very obvious that a lot of people have no control over their emotions. Half of the, most of the content I make is because people don't have control over the emotions and it's easy to to, get, to create content around that. But I think if you're a dude, it's important to be a hundred, you know, a thousand percent honest with yourself about how you're feeling. And it can be difficult to know what that feeling is because we have a lot of responsibilities. It's easy to get inside your own head and start to spiral in a way that can be unhealthy. And so you got to take a step back and be like, what, what is this? Why am I feeling this way? How can I talk about this with someone that, you know, it's important or someone that could, who can I talk about this with that might understand where I'm coming from? And I think for guys, a lot of times it, it would be other men. I think it's important for men to be able to converse and talk with other men about these feelings, because I just think there is a, a gap. Like, you know, I say this as a man who is married, there are problems that I have in my life that I just wouldn't want to bring to my wife. I'm not saying I can't tell her everything because I feel comfortable saying anything I need to to her no matter what, but I just think that there are things I don't want to burden her with because she can't relate to those things because she's not a man. It's so important to have healthy relationships with other men and be able to talk about these things and talk about these struggles because they're real. And it's super easy to fall into the trap of just pretending like, you know, if you're an alpha male, you know, you're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to talk about your feelings, the old blue collar, fucking rub some dirt on it, turn the other cheek. I get it. But so often that eventually manifests and boils over into something incredibly unhealthy. And so I'm not suggesting that you should be crying every time you watch a movie or dumping your feelings on everybody around you. But I think you, I think it's important for men to be selective and I think it's important for men to share what they're going through, but also be selective with who you share it. And I know that's easier said than done. It's not always easy to have somebody in your life where you feel comfortable doing that with. For some people, it can be family. It can be siblings. It can be father-son type of relationship. For other men, it's obviously a relationship you've built in your life, whether through college, school, work, whatever it might be. But you'd be surprised. I mean, you know, I have, I have a lot. I have a lot, a lot of friends and acquaintances in my life. There aren't a lot of them that I would go super deep with. But when you do have someone in your life who you feel comfortable being very open and honest and raw with and going beyond that surface level bullshit, like normal guy, ha ha bullshit. It can be so cathartic and so therapeutic and so helpful to be able to have someone to talk to about stuff like that. Brainworms is really the perfect example of people that lack 
emotional control. I always wonder sometimes when I watch these videos and I see these people behaving in such a way in public and just, it, and I'm, I think to myself, like, how, how do you get to a point in your life where you, there's even a possibility that you would act this erratic and jeopardize your life or the health or the jeopardize your reputation, someone's health, like put people in danger because over what? Over something super innocuous, over something super innocuous, like road rage or like somebody, uh, somebody uh, disrespected you at a grocery store, you know, like stupid shit like that. And all of a sudden you've done something stupid because you couldn't control that emotion. And now you've changed the course of your life negatively because that one moment you weren't able to wrangle that in. So there's a lot of years and a lot of different things that go into the ability to be able to have a heightened sense of control over what you're feeling, feeling those feelings as they're coming on and knowing how to mitigate those if they're negative. I think that's easier said than done, but I think it's so important. I think that starts with healthy relationships and it starts with being able to recognize them and that recognition comes from knowing them and knowing them comes from being able to talking about it with yourself, but with other people and just being able to, it's, it's a self-awareness around those emotions. So anyone who's a high value individual that has healthy relationships is somebody that is emotionally intelligent and has control over their emotions to the extent that they can still fly off the handle and feel these emotions and get the heightened sense of sadness or anger or rate, whatever it is, but you're able to let logic win that battle every time and not let the emotions get the best of you and make you do something that you will regret. That emotional intelligence bleeds into other areas. Like I said, self-awareness around your emotions, empathy, um, the ability to think of others before yourself without sacrificing your own values is huge. And that's kind of bleed, you know, that leads back to the generosity and selflessness piece. A lot of these things I'm talking about are all connected in a way. Um, it's like a network and, uh, you know, some, I think for some people that, uh, there are certain nodes in the network that, uh, need more love and more attention because naturally some of them are running on all cylinders while others are just not working as well. And that's different for everybody. And I think everyone kind of, or, or most people have a rough idea of maybe what their strengths and weaknesses are in this area. And that can help inform, you know, what you might spend time working on. And that kind of leads me to the next, you know, one of the final things, which is essentially just a commitment to growth. And that sounds kind of, I sound like my fucking parents or like, I don't even know what that, I don't know what I sound like, but it's the idea that you don't just get to a certain point in your life and then you kick your feet up on the recliner and you just coast for the next 50 years. It's like, there's nothing more admirable than people that are hungry for growth, whether that is through learning, through relationship building, physical growth, all of these things. It's just the commitment to be like, you know what? I don't know where this life's going to take me, where I'm going to end up. But if you have a commitment to trying to level up every step of the way, understanding that you're going to fall short and you're never going to you know, reach this sort of promised land, it's this particular obsession and commitment to the process of learning, of getting better, of being like, Hey, this is something I'm very weak at. This is a, this is a part of me that I, I, you know, I'm not proud of. And instead of being like, eh, well, that's just who I am. Yeah. You know? Sucks to be me. Like, no, dude, like spend some time. How can we, how can we work on these things? It's not to say they're all, they're ever going to go away. No one's ever going to be, become this kind of perfect specimen, but it's just waking up daily and instead of being complacent and, you know, like I said earlier, like pointing fingers, like, oh, I'll fucking, this is what life's got me. Like the government does this and the fucking jobs suck and inflation and my fucking wife doesn't take care of the kid. It's like, instead of being that guy, you wake up and you're the guy that's like, hey, these are the areas in my life that I'm not proud of, that I'm not happy with right now. And I'm committed to doing what it takes to help these areas grow. I need to add some water to these and help them grow. Or if there's things you need to cut out, you cut those things out. That's all it is. It's a decision. That's what it starts with. Everything starts with a decision and a commitment 
to wanting something more, something better. And that's truthfully what it comes down to. And I think for some people that comes a lot more naturally to the point where it almost doesn't even pop up on their radar. I think, you know, individuals that are inherently go-getters and just that's, that's their speed. That's their normal speed is constantly wanting that next thing or getting better, which can honestly get to a point where it's a detriment to your life. There obviously needs to be a balance in some respects where you're enjoying your relationships and your life. You know, the flip side of that is the person who has just become completely complacent and has completely given up on the idea of a different life or a better life, even if they're in a situation that they hate. And that to me is the saddest thing because I think there's an interesting disposition with people that are living a life that they're either not particularly proud of or that they don't like, and they just feel helpless to the point like there's not like there's nothing they can do to change it. And I don't think that that could be any farther from the truth. I think that there's obviously responsibilities that you're kind of locked into, and there's some things like careers and things that are set in motion that you're involved in that feel unchangeable or untenable to leave or, ch- you know, to, to shift the momentum in a different way. But the reality is everything starts with the decision and the mindset that like I could wake up tomorrow and completely alter the course of my life with a few small steps. And you do those same things day after day. Like no one's forcing you to work. You it, it, it's that, it's that simple. All of these things I've talked about today kind of circle back to this idea that you are the arbiter of your own life and that you are in control of your own life. Nobody, again, with this the accountability, nobody is going to do it for you. A, no politician, no government body, no federal organization, no tax cuts, no fucking, nothing, none of these things are going to give you the life you want. It is strictly on your shoulders to make the decision to do what's necessary to start building something that you're proud of. And in my journey, I don't know where I'm at with that. I've done some fucking cool things. I've done some shit I'm not proud of, but I have a commitment to growth and a commitment to continue wanting to try and be a better version of myself in a sense while fully embracing the fact that I'm also a degenerate cocksucker at the same time in many ways. (laughs) And uh, just figuring out how to navigate that and continuing to try and be self-aware and embody the things that I think are valuable and trying and failing and just slowly chipping away and getting better in the process. And I hope that if you're still listening in the end right here after this little segment about the tenets of, of what it means to be a man, just that kind of, I put on, on pa- I put down on paper briefly, just not thinking too hard about it. If you're still here, I, I, I appreciate you listening. I hope that you found something valuable from it. I don't know what that means. You could be older than me, my same age, maybe you're 20, getting out of the college, going into joining the workforce. I hope that there was one sentence or one phrase that might've made you think and be like, oh yeah. But ultimately the punchline is that, you know, we are ultimately in control and we are the, the arbiters of our own lives. And every second we waste being fearful of the things we can't control, all the stuff we consume all the time, like all these things going on out in the, out in the ether, out in the online hellscape just wasted time because there are so many things that are within our control. We just got to make the decisions, start making moves and that's it. And I hope you do that. And I hope you're having a great week and I hope you have a better weekend. And I appreciate you for listening to Decently and Decent. And I can't wait to see you next week when we talk about something else. Talk to you soon. Peace.